Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Union Church of Los Angeles for our Sunday morning combined English language worship service. Thank you especially to you hearty souls who have joined us here in the sanctuary despite the weather. Welcome to you and welcome to everyone on Zoom. If you are on Zoom, please mute your device at this time. Thank you. And now Jin and I will begin our service by playing In Christ Alone. Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Dan and Jin, for uh, well, just kind of ushering us into worship this morning. Um, uh, it is hot out there for sure. Um, this is usually where I start anticipating that um, change of season. And uh, in LA, we always have that extra, extra little um, heat that comes right right now. And I feel like we have another one that comes in October too. Um, but I was thinking about seasons uh, this morning and just even how in different seasons um, we have, we experience God differently. I don't know if you've ever experienced that time, those seasons where you're struggling to hear God's voice or those seasons where you feel like everything around you is so loud that you're struggling to to focus and to contemplate on who God is and then there's other times where we are it's this very strong almost that you feel the spirit so strongly so I just wanted to encourage you that in whatever season that you're in right now in your relationship with the Lord um, that there there's a place for it and to to not despair to not feel like God is far God is always near always near, whether you are hearing him loudly or whether you're in a season um, where you feel more, more dry or more distant. He is always, always with you. I wanted to pray over us this morning um, to, uh, so that we can all enter into worship together. Holy One, our Maker, we gather to worship you, to renew our spirits, and to connect as a community. Some of us crave a joyful noise, some flourish in quiet contemplation, Others desire movement, while others need to ponder our thoughts. However we worship, we gather here. In this place, we find you in the midst of us. In this connectivity, we know that your covenant remains in effect. May your spirit guide, empower, and speak. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Megan. At this time, we would like you to all stand if you are able. And join in singing our first song, actually our first two songs, because this will be a medley of two gospel tunes, I'm Gonna Live So God Can Use Me, and Peace Like a River. Ready? And a one, two, three, four, one. I'm gonna live so.
sing so God can use me anywhere Lord anytime I'm gonna sing so God can use me I've got peace. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. Peace like a river, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got peace, joy, love like a river, fountain, ocean, I've got peace, joy, love in my soul. I've got peace, joy, love. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, this morning's community prayer, I usually make it so that we say we, um, but this one I felt like there was, a, there was an individual expression, so the word I is in there and it is intentional. Um, I will be reading the part that says one and you all will join me for the part that says all. Lord, I thank you that through you I am more than enough and that I possess the knowledge, skills, and talent to do everything that you have called me to do on this earth. I declare that my purpose is assured and that everything that is for me comes to me. Nothing that tries to hinder me will succeed. Thank you that no matter what a circumstance or situation looks like, I can rest assured that I am an overcomer and that I am more than a conqueror in each and every environment in which I go. I declare that I am not an imposter. I am genuine. I am real. I am more than enough. I overcome every obstacle that is placed before me. I declare and decree that I am all that you have called me to be today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thanks very much, Megan. At this time, <clears throat> excuse me, at this time, please stand if you are able for our opening hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues. Ready? Two, three, one, two.
All right, this morning I'd like to call Sojourner and Nathaniel up to help me light the candles. All right. And everybody else may be seated. We light a light in the name of the maker who lit the world and breathed the breath of life for us. We light a light in the name of the sun who saved the world and stretched out his hand to us. We light a light in the name of the spirit who heals the world and fills our souls with yearning. And all together we say, we light, we light three, three lights, lights in, in the name, name of the, the Trinity of love, God, God above us, us. God beside us, God beneath us, the beginning, the end, the everlasting one. Okay, Nathaniel, Nathaniel and, and Sojourner, stay up here with me. Oh, where are you guys going? They're done. They said, we know where this is going. All right, that means the rest of you guys are going to have to help me out. As, uh, I invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to pass the peace in a little bit, but we're going to sing this song of hope and of joy and of life, like this little life of mine. Join me as we sing together. remain standing because we're going to get out of our seats and greet one another here in a second. Uh, now is our passing of the peace liturgy uh, that we're going to speak out together. So if you could all join me. Christ is, is our, our peace. peace. It's not, not an easy peace, peace not an, an insignificant peace, peace not a half-hearted peace. But may, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us now. The peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. You may stand, rise out of your seat, gather together, uh, greet one another. We welcome everyone. All right. We have our 10-second uh, warning. <laughs> you guys slowly wrap up conversations, hugs. Beautiful. Good morning, Pastor Ken. Good morning. Pastor Ken is going to be doing our scripture reading this morning. From there, he sent out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered the house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home 
found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre, went by the way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, if I tell if I tell her, that is be open. And immediately his ears were open, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered him to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more jealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. to God. Amen. God's loving, life-giving, and liberating word for the people of God this morning. Thanks be to God. Good things come to those who what? Good things come to those who what? Okay, we're going to challenge that this morning, amen? It's the scripture that does this this morning, so follow me. I think like most of, like most of you, I've been raised with that kind of understanding. Good things come to those who wait. That's a very popular refrain or almost like a proverb, a, a parable that we've been taught. I'm going to challenge you this morning to think about this. Good things come to those who hustle. Somebody say hustle. Good things come to those who hustle. It's a very challenging passage. In this passage of scripture that Pastor Ken Yabuki read, we hear Jesus say something that is just extremely, almost unforgivable. Jesus looks at this Syrophoenician woman, this Canaanite, this Greek woman, and calls her a dog. Open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 7. Why in the world would Jesus call a woman, a mother, who is begging Jesus to heal his daughter, a dog? This week I've been going over commentaries and commentaries. I've listened to several sermons. I don't think I've done as much research on many other passages than this one just because it shocked me again. I've heard this passage of scripture and I was just so, so, um, I wanted to get this right. I wanted to get this right. And what I heard from most commentaries and what I heard from most pastors is pastors theologically putting themselves in a pretzel, trying to soften Jesus calling a mother, begging Jesus to heal her daughter, a dog, go away. Let me feed the children first, and then I'll throw some crumbs to the dogs. And the woman says, no, I need my healing now. My baby is sick. And Jesus says, man, this lady is tough. <laughs> Good things come to those who hustle. <laughs> All right, let's look at this passage of Scripture again. And then I'm going to encourage you to look at it again in the, chap in the book of Matthew, because this is... Just such, it's one of those passages that most preachers, they want to gloss over it. It was an anomaly. Jesus was compassionate. Jesus was loving. Jesus would never hurt anybody's feelings. And here Jesus is having a difficult moment. And let's read it again together. Mark chapter 7, verse 24. And for those of you who have been worshiping with us for the last few Sundays, you'll remember what we were talking about. We were talking about the, this moment in which Jesus walks on water, feeds 5,000, and then goes on this massive discourse, this massive teaching on how he is the bread of life. You have to eat his body and drink his blood. And he was speaking to the Jewish community, and they rejected him. And then last week we saw that not only did they reject him, they brought the head honchos from Jerusalem to start 
doing a little spiritual auditing. This guy's a little out there. This young rabbi from Galilee, he's going off the, the beaten path a little too much. And so in this passage of scripture, Jesus says, let's get out of here. Let's go up to Tyre. Let's go up to Sidon, present day Lebanon. Jesus does not just get out of Galilee. He just didn't just leave the Jewish region. He goes all the way almost into the middle, the, the northern part of the Middle East. He's all the way up in Lebanon, outside of the community of present day Beirut. Jesus goes to Tyre and Sidon because he's tired and he's frustrated of having to try to convince people time and again that he is the Messiah. He is the bread of life. And the Bible tells us that he comes up to this community and he sees this Canaanite woman, Syrophoenician, which in other words, she's a Gentile. In other words, she is, Jesus was just accused of welcoming people that were unclean and they, the religious leaders are concerned that his disciples aren't washing their hands properly before they, a reasonable but also kind of ticky-tack complaint against Jesus. So Jesus says, you know what, I'm going to go up here. And someone who would be proverbially beyond clean, a Syrophoenician Canaanite woman who's got a daughter with a demon. Let's read it together. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know where he, that he was there. He was, uh, let me fill in the gap a little bit. I think Jesus was tired. <laughs> Jesus wanted to get away. He had just finished this massive confrontation with the Jewish leaders. He goes up to Lebanon. He goes far away from the drama of the Galilee region, far away from the, 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 the oversight of the Jewish leaders. He goes to Tyre and he goes to Sidon, a place synonymous with paganism. In fact, it was the epicenter of paganism in that region. A very famous woman came from the city of Tyre named Jezebel. Jezebel was the one that tormented the people of God and, and married Ahab. And there was this whole difficult Old Testament story with this, with this Syrophoenician queen. And the Bible tells us that Jesus goes there. And this Syrophoenician Canaanite, this Syrophoenician Greek woman, comes and says to Jesus this in verse, in verse uh, 25. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. This passage of scripture is also in, in Matthew chapter 12. And the Bible says that when she bowed down in Matthew chapter 15, she said, have mercy on me, son of David. That word, son of David, that name, son of David, is a messianic title. So this Syrophoenician Gentile woman doesn't just go and hear about the miracle worker. She immediately bows down and acknowledges, you are the Messiah. We've heard about you. We heard about the walking on the water. We've heard about the feeding of the 5,000. We've heard about you doing miracles in excess. I have an emergency. Verse 26. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician origin. Another translation says she was a Greek person of Syrophoenician origin, meaning that she wasn't even pure in that sense, right? She was, her, her nationality, if you will, was Greek because the Greeks had an empire, but her actual ethnic origin was Syrophoenician, meaning that she was mixed among a non-Jewish non setting. So she was really an outcast, outcast among outcasts. And we continue reading, she says, he said, he said, uh, uh, Syrophoenician origin, she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And here's where it gets really tricky for those of us who are pastors on a Sunday morning trying to explain why Jesus would call a woman a dog. Verse 27 says, he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's fruit, food and throw it to the dogs. And she answered him, but she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And Jesus said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home 
found the chi child lying on the bed and the demons gone. In chapter 15 of Matthew, the exact same story says it like this, that when Jesus saw her, he says, I've never seen such great faith in anywhere I've preached. In verse, uh, Jesus says in verse 27 of Matthew chapter 15, Jesus answered her and said, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done as you wish. All right, let's unpack that. By the way, I don't think I'm going to be able to get to the second uh, miracle. We got about, <laughs> we're, we're not going to make this long, but I really want to dig into this woman because I'm obsessed with her. I'm infatuated with this woman's faith. She's captivated me this week. I've been reading about the Syrophoenician woman. There's a second miracle that, we, that Pastor Ken read in this passage of scripture, which after Jesus heals this woman, there's a man who's deaf, and he hears about the miracles, and Jesus gives him, read it for yourself, chapter, uh, chapter 7 of Mark, verses 31 through 37, Jesus gives him a holy wet willy. Amen? <laughs> read it for yourself. He asks to be healed. He puts his ears in his, he puts his fingers in his ears, spits on the ground, puts it in his tongue, and the guy, voila, he's healed. It's a spiritual wet willy, amen? It's just a very interesting passage of scripture. The context, we're, we're not going to really dig into this because we're going to talk about this woman, amen? So this woman comes to Jesus, and Jesus almost insults her. Why would Jesus do that? How do we explain this behavior? So again, the context of this passage of scripture is Jesus fleeing, if you will, from, from the Holy Land, fleeing from the Galilee region. And, and some translations use the Greek term to not just flee, but to be a fugitive. The Jewish leaders that were there uh, examining Jesus' ministry, auditing his ministry, if you will, questioning the validity his, of his ministry, they were now upset. They were now ready to prosecute Jesus, and Jesus says, we got to get out of here. Let's go up to Tyre. Let's go up to Sidon. Let's go way, way outside the boundaries. And he finds this woman. And this woman, the Bible says, comes to Jesus while Jesus, I I am going to insinuate while well, Jesus wanted to be left alone. The Bible tells us very clearly that when Jesus goes into a, to the house, he says, don't let anybody know that I'm here. This is kind of my personal time. I want to be alone. I don't want to be bothered. I just have this beef. The more that I do miracles, the more they question, the more that I long for these people to acknowledge that I'm the fulfillment of their prayers, for them to acknowledge that I am the Messiah, I am the Savior, I am the Lord, the more they want another sign. The more they want a little more evidence. Give us another confirmation. And Jesus says, let's get away. And he goes not just to a, 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 a neighboring community. We often talk about, those of you who study scripture, we know that there's an underlying tension primarily between the Samaritans and the Jewish people. In Bible study, many people will, will, will note that Samaritans were like their half cousins, if you will. They were part Jewish, part uh, non-Jewish, but they worshiped in the same region. They worshiped at, alongside of one another. The Syrophoenicians, the Canaanites, they were the pagans, they were the Gentiles, they were completely the others. The Bible says that Jesus doesn't just go to the Samaritans. He goes way, way, way behind enemy lines, if you will. And this woman from Syrophoenician origin would have been someone that had extraordinary animosity. The Philistines came from the Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians gave us Goliath, amen? This is an old, old bad blood. And the Bible says she comes and she begs Jesus for a miracle. And Jesus, I want to say, I will this morning insinuate, instead of trying to explain away, well, Jesus didn't really mean it that way. I heard so many commentaries this week that were basically trying to soften why Jesus would have called her a dog. And say, well, he kind of used the word puppy in Greek. Yeah, technically he used the word puppy, but... Yeah, that's not passing the smell test, man. You call a woman a dog, 
in any culture, in any community, I have no, I have no recollection of anybody taking that as a compliment. Maybe in the hood, we're like, hey, what's up, dog? That's the only context that I know dog is used in a somewhat uh, acceptable manner, right? But in nowhere, particularly in that era in the Middle East to be considered a dog, remember dogs in that era were scavengers. They, they, they often were in the outskirts and they would, they would scavenge, they would eat unclean things. So it was not commonplace to have domesticated pets at the table. And the Bible says that this woman persisted. Jesus, knowing the tension between the Gentiles and the Jewish people, kind of responds, what I want to say is in frustration. The Bible tells us that Jesus was often subject to the same emotions that you and I experience. Jesus was 100% divine and 100% human. This is the mystery of Jesus the Christ. When we use the word Jesus Christ, remember Christ is not his last name. Jesus Christ refers to his role. Jesus refers to his humanity. Christ refers to his divinity. So when we use the term Jesus Christ, we're speaking to the whole of Jesus, his humanity and his divinity. Jesus was human. Jesus wept. Jesus was angry. Jesus was tired. Jesus took a nap. Jesus was hungry. Jesus got thirsty. Jesus needed to go to the restroom. Jesus needed to take a break. Jesus needed friendship. Jesus experienced everything you and I experience. I think in this passage, Jesus experienced frustration. He's frustrated. And he snaps at this woman. And he says, let me try to figure out how to save these folks before I deal with trying to save y'all. That's what I think he's saying. Let me deal with the people down south in Galilee and Jerusalem, and then your time will come. And you know what this lady says? Jesus, let me turn your no into a yes. Amen? Those of you who are parents, amen? Any of you have children or grandchildren, or those of you who have nieces and nephews, have you ever experienced a child who you say, hey, we're not going to get ice cream today. We're not going to get a treat. It's, that's it, you know? And they just know how to, like, turn your no into a, oh, you know, it is kind of hot, mom. They know, how to, they know how to work that angle. This is precisely what happens in this passage. Jesus calls her a dog and says, let me, let me feed the children first, and then I will take care of the dogs. And, Jesus, and listen to her answer. Jesus, the, the Syrophoenician said, in, in verse 28. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the, the children's crumbs. Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 15 gives us a little bit more context of her response. Matthew's gospel says she persisted. She would not leave him alone. The Bible says in Matthew, this very same story, that the disciples were like, man, she keeps yapping. She keeps knocking at the table and will not persist and she and she answers with almost this coyish witty rebuttal fair enough i'm a dog <laughs> got me dead to rights but even the dogs need some crumbs from here and there jesus hook a brother up hook a sister up and jesus turns to her and then matthew says i have never seen such great faith i just snapped in frustration I'm tired. I want to get away. I don't want to be bothered by people who are struggling to see who I am. And this woman bows and says, you're the Messiah. You're the son of David. And I need a miracle now. Go away. I got to fix this. Go. I'll take care of the dogs later. Hey, dogs got to eat too. Dogs get hungry too. And Jesus looks at her. Where, where this woman could have easily responded with anger. How dare you? How dare you call me a dog? How dare you insult me like that? But she doesn't. She says, listen, I need my miracle and I need it now. Let's get this done. Let's turn this no into a yes. This is not the first time in scripture we see Jesus almost jostling with people. And again, 
I'm going to try to tie this up cleanly theologically because I don't want you to walk out from the church this morning thinking that I have to convince Jesus to do something he doesn't want to do for me. I don't want you to walk out with that impression. However, however, the Bible has examples of when God repented or God changed his mind. I'm going to give you three examples of when God changed his mind on something. The first one is in Exodus chapter 32. The Bible says in verse 12, Exodus 32, God changed his mind and decided not to judge Israel after Moses and Amos interceded for them. You'll recall that there was a moment in the wilderness in which God gets frustrated because they're, wa they're wandering in the desert, complaining, grumbling, and grumbling. And God basically says to Moses, listen, let me wipe all these folks out. I'll start over with you. I did it already with I did it already with, 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 uh, with, uh, with Noah and the ark. I blew everything up. Let me start over with you. You know what Noah says to God? Noah says to God, I'm sorry, Moses says to God, Moses says, Lord, if you destroy these people, what will the Egyptians say about you? <laughs> what will the Egyptians say about you? And the Bible says Jesus changed his mind. Exodus chapter 32. The Bible talks to us a story in the Bible. There's a story about Sodom and Gomorrah. You guys know this famous story about Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a man named Lot. A man named Lot who kind of bartered with Jesus. God looks at Sodom and Gomorrah, sees the, 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 the debauchery that's afoot, and he says, I'm going to nuke the whole thing. And, no, and, and Lot starts to, to, to almost uh, barter on behalf of the community and says, well, let's, what if there's 25 people? Will you save the city? And Jesus says, oh, I don't know. What about, okay, how about 20 people? How about 15 people? 10 people. Give me 10 people. And God says, okay, for 10 people, I'll save the city, right? There's this jostling. It's almost this moment in which God is like, man, can we do that with God? Can we deal with God? Can we barter with God? Is that how prayer works? If I just keep pestering Jesus, will he answer my prayer? I want you to hold that tension, amen? Because when we pray the Lord's Prayer, what do we say? Our Father who art there in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Not my will. Thy will be done. Jesus said it himself. But in this passage of scripture, we see a Syrophoenician woman that gets rebuffed. Come on, get out of the way. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do something here. And she's like, uh, Jesus, uh, yeah, not that simple. I need this. I need this miracle now. And Jesus insults her. And instead of being offended, she kind of turns it into a, a joke. Yeah, I'm a dog, but you know, hook a sister up. And Jesus is like, you have great faith, woman. <laughs> you have tremendous faith. So this morning, I want to close with this, with this thought or this, this, this encouragement to you. We started off saying good things come to those who wait. And I'm encouraging you this morning to consider that not just do good things come to those who wait, good things come to those who hustle. I want you to hold these two truths because they don't cancel each other out. They're two sides of this very united truth. They're two sides of this continuum. The, 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 mo the moral of what I see in this story, of this woman who instead of being offended, almost convinces Jesus to act on her behalf, is that this woman understood that her faith was not just to be passive, but her faith was to be active. For many people, our faith is passive in the sense that we believe God can do it, but we have a, perhaps an attitude that, well, if it's God's will, que sera, sera. I'm going to say a prayer, and if it's God's will, let's see what happens. Anybody identify with that? You pray, and you're like, hey, it's out of my control. It's in God's hands. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? It's really good for us to acknowledge that we are not in control of all things. We are not in control of all things. God's in control, but we are not in control of all things. We love, the, we love feeling in control of things. And there's this fatalistic 
expression of faith that can corrupt that very beautiful thing of understanding that we are not in control. And I say it's, it, it corrupts because fatalism is not faith. Fatalism is saying, well, whatever the world throws at me, I'm just going to accept it. No. <laughs> There's got to be a part of your faith that says the world is broken. My life is not as it should be. It's time for me to get to work. It's time for me to activate my faith. Now, let me talk about the distortion of that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a distortion of that truth in which we start the, there's a, there's a funny line that, that a lot of preachers will say, there's blab it and grab it Christianity, amen? Name it and claim it. I want Jesus to rubber stamp all of my secret wishes. We start trying to treat God like a, like a genie in a bottle. Lord, I need that Mercedes. Lord, I need that job. Lord, I need that person. Lord, I need that house. Lord, I need you to do this for me. And that's a little bit of a, the, the, the extreme of trying to coerce God into being your genie in a bottle. And it's, that's, that's an abnormality as well. This woman, I believe, walks that fine line of saying, sure, I'm not the chosen one. We're not the chosen people now, but we have, we have you at the table now. And you're with us now. And you're with us for a reason. Because they have rejected you and we're welcoming you. And the Bible looks at this woman and looks at the gentleman after who was deaf. And they are fed. And they are healed. The story of these two, these two healings leads to another extraordinary miracle. We talked about Jesus feeding the 5,000. There's another mass healing. And this time Jesus heals 4,000. If you look at your Bibles in Mark chapter 8, Jesus heals 4,000. In chapter 6, Jesus fed 5,000 and there was 12 baskets left, left over. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus heals 4,000 in Lebanon and there's seven baskets left over. What I think is happening in this passage from the moment this zero Phoenician woman turns Jesus' no into a yes, as Jesus begins to minister to the Gentiles. That is a massive moment in the scripture. Jesus begins to minister to non-Jewish people, and they, and they receive the message in mass. The Bible says towards the end of, 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 of verse 30, 36, Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone but the more he ordered them not to say anything, the more they spread the word around. And again, this was not in Judea. This is not in Jerusalem. This was in the, the, the Decapolis. This was in the Greek region. Jesus begins that ministry, and he's, and he's torn, I believe. He's, he's torn because he wants the people of promise to receive him. Yet he's going abroad, and they receive him in mass. I want to close with this encouragement this morning. I want to close with this encouragement this morning. This morning, I want you to, to hold these two truths in tension. It's very, very hard to keep things in tension. I'm going to go back to the parenting analogy, because it's, for me, you know, obviously, like, in this season of life, we have five kids. Uh, so parenting is a very front of center thing in my mind. I want my kids to, to be my friends, amen? I want them to like me, amen? Any parents identify with that? I want my kids to like me. I want my kids to want to hang out with me. But I also want them to respect and understand that there's law and there's, there's, a, there's, there, there's a tension that we as parents have to manage in our homes, right? We want them to be able to obey us, but we also want them to be comfortable. It's a tension. Those, that, that's a balance that you have to strike in, in, in any family, in any marriage, in any relationship. You can substitute that for any situation where there's a power dynamic. You want to be buddies with your boss, but they're still your boss, right? You want to be friends with, with people that, that are in different uh, chain of command in your life, but it's a tension. Jesus is looking at us and inviting us to stand in this tension of good things come to those who wait. Yes. We trust God. We believe that God is going to fulfill the promises in our life. We trust God. We know that God's in control. That's a truth.
But I want you to balance that this morning <laughs> with the faith that is active, with the faith that is bold, with the faith that is tenacious, with the faith that, like this Syrophoenician woman, refuses to take no for an answer. Good things come to those who hustle. Amen? I want to encourage you this morning, whatever you're praying for, whatever you're believing for, whatever you're trusting God to do in your life, put a little grit into it. Amen? <laughs> put a little elbow grease into it this morning. That's what this lady did. She didn't get bitter. She didn't get offended. She didn't get triggered. She didn't get whatever you want to call it. She looked and she said, with a smirk, I think, and a wink. Come on, Jesus. Even dogs got to eat too. And Jesus says, woman, you got some nerve. <laughs> Just for that, because of how you responded, because of your attitude, because of your tenacity, because of your ganas, because of your heart, because of your boldness, you've compelled me. <laughs> you've turned, you turned my, my frustration into a chuckle. And you know what? Go home. Your daughter's okay. The Bible says that when she gets home, the little girl is sitting up. She's happy. She's robust. And mama got the job done. Mama got the job done. Good things come to those who hustle. Amen? Hold that intention. Hold that tension with good things come to those who wait. Don't cancel them out. Hold them in tension. They're both true. They're both true. Good things come to those who wait, and good things come to those who hustle. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, you are a God who hustles on our behalf. Lord, you invite us to both abide in you and rest in you and Sabbath in you, and you're a God who calls us to stand up and run and fight and wrestle and continue to persevere. Lord, we thank you for these two truths, God, that are part of our lived experience, God. We thank you for the peace that surpasses all understanding, and we thank you for the resiliency and the tenacity that comes from our faith. Lord, help us, God, to be those who are well-rounded in our faith, those who know when it's time to rest and those who understand when it's time to get up and get busy. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of summer and you're a God of winter. You're a God of fall and you're a God of spring. You're a God of abundance and you're a God in the seasons of lack. Lord, you do not change. We thank you. We thank you that you walk with us in seasons of maturity where we understand, God, deeper this truth that you bring to us. Lord, we thank you for the testimony of our sister, this Syrophoenician queen, Lord. Bless her. Blessed legacy, God. May it instruct us as we go forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Reuben. Once again, I ask that you please take a minute to silently reflect on Pastor Reuben's message during the interlude. Amen. We're going to continue worshiping the Lord this morning through the giving of our gifts. 
by receiving our tithes and our offering. Again, we uh, remind each and every one of us that this time of giving of our, of our offerings and our gifts, it's such a wonderful opportunity for us to take a, a moment of faith, a step of faith. We give because God has been so blessing and so giving and so generous to each and every one of us. The Bible tells us that God loves the cheerful giver. There's nothing better that brings God more joy than when we bring our gifts and gratitude for all that God has blessed us with. So this morning we want to create that opportunity. There's some pink envelopes there for those of you who are uh, in the church this morning. For those of you who are on Zoom, we again thank you for joining us and worshiping with us. There's a QR code and a way for folks to give online. We want to invite the ushers to come forth at this time as we receive these gifts before God. Amen. Please join me if you're able to on your feet as we sing our doxology and gratitude for all that God has presented to us in joy. we thank you. Lord, your word says that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. Lord, your word tells us that we, being wicked fathers and mothers, know how to give our children good gifts. How much won't our Father bless us in heaven? Lord, we thank you that you pursue us with your goodness. You track us down with your love and your mercy. Lord, we give this morning because we're grateful. We give this morning because we understand that you own everything, and you've given it to us in abundance. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we don't have to fear. We don't have to be in doubt. We don't have to worry about tomorrow because, God, we trust you. We thank you for these gifts. May they be a blessing to your kingdom. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I want to invite our wonderful chairperson, uh, Megan Nuno, to come up and give us some announcements, let us know what's going on. In the life of the church, we do hope that you stay warm, or stay cold, okay, cool. You, we know you'll stay warm. We hope you stay cool for the rest of the summer. I think Thursday is about, it's supposed to level out, amen, so we'll start uh, dusting off those, uh, those, those sweaters and get them back into circulation. All right, um, we have our usual announcements and then two, um, two specific announcements. Our Saturday morning prayer on Zoom is at 8 a.m. on Saturdays, and our Sunday Bible study uh, with Pastor Ken, who did our scripture reading, is at 9 a.m. on Sundays, and the link can be found in the newsletter um, that uh, is sent out every week. You should normally get it on Friday mornings. Um, and then our Thursday night ministry on Skid Row with Be a Little Better continues. It's really been a wonderful time. And the good news is this week, this Thursday, the weather will like drop by 20, 30 degrees and it'll be a wonderful night to go out and to bless, uh, bless our neighbors um, on uh, Skid Row. Um, and then we, we have our overflow parking, which is um, kind of that direction on the corner of 4, 450 East 3rd Street and Omar Street. 
Um, Vessi is not here this morning, uh, but we do have our movie night coming up at 4 p.m. on, it's at Saturday, 4 p.m. on the 21st. But I'm not sure what the movie is. I'm sure Vessi is going to, uh, what is it? It's Casablanca. Oh, it's Casablanca, which I love. So that's amazing. So most of you are probably familiar with Casablanca. That's going to be a fun, a fun time. We're usually, we, we, sit, we kind of pull, bring camping chairs and enjoy it. There's popcorn and, uh, and treats. And then afterwards, we usually discuss, we sit around and discuss the movie. So it's just a really, it's a kind of a fun time to come together. So Casablanca, come on out. Um, after service, we have a quick 15 minute ask. Um, Amy, can you wave your hand? Here's Amy. She runs our uh, Union Rescue Mission donation area. Uh, that's right in the social hall right now. It's like being kind of blocked off. Um, they can only come out to pick up the items if they're in uh, boxes or in bags. And um, I think what we kind of did this last month is a lot of us brought items and we just put it there, but without it's not contained in anything. So we just need maybe two or three helpers, maybe four, uh, to help bag up um, some of the loose items that are there. So we figure if like three or four people are back there, it'll only take about 15 minutes. It's quite a lot of stuff, but I think with some, a few extra hands, we can get it all into bags and um, then they'll be able to pick it up this week. So if you could help with that, that'd be awesome. Um, and then I believe that was it. That was just my one extra one. So there you go. All right, Pastor Ruben. Oh, yes. Uh, Sister Lily, would you raise your hand back there? We have and we have a wonderful volunteer program. And uh, Pastor Inho, would you raise your hand as well back there, Pastor Inho? Let's give some love to Pastor Inho. Behind the scenes, behind the scenes, there's some technical aspects going on with the slides and projectors and cameras. Those of you who have ever joined us, uh, maybe when you're traveling through Zoom, there's a wonderful. Uh, uh, intricate uh, network of, of, of cameras and, and video that is behind the scenes. We are needing some technical volunteers. If you are um, technologically gifted or maybe not so gifted but would like to learn how to do that, we need folks to help us with the slides during Sunday or help us with the uh, projector uh, setup. If anybody is interested in doing that, uh, we could we would love to share with you guys how that happens it's a very very smooth uh, system it's not very complicated we just uh, would appreciate uh, some volunteers if you're interested in that please see myself or uh, see sister Lily or Megan and we'll put you in contact and we'll make sure that you are able to help us in that capacity and again we thank you all so much in advance for your volunteering and if you can stick around and help us put things in boxes and bags for urm again we are so grateful please join me as we stand and we go forth from this place with the blessing and with the benediction i mentioned to you that uh i i did struggle a lot <laughs> this this sun this week M wanting to make sure that we struck the right tension of trusting in god and rolling up our sleeves and getting our hands dirty. This tension, this tension. As we go forth from this place, I want to go, I want to leave you with a blessing. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what you can ask or imagine. It's not up to you to fix the world. It's God. God's in charge. But God invites each and every one of us to bring our gifts, bring our hustle, bring our, 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 our unique talents to the table. So if you would stretch your hands to this place i want to bless your hands lord i thank you for these hands that have been gifted these hands that have unique talents and gifts god each person here you have given a unique fingerprint to and a unique set of hustle lord i pray that you activate in each and every one of us that magic spark that you deposited in us and may we use it for your glory may we use it to lift high the name that is above every name in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Reuben. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, He Touched Me.
Thank you very much for joining us today. Have a great day and a great week, and we'll see you next week.